The Desire of Ages Chapter 81 The Lord is Risen This chapter is based on the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 2 through 4, and chapter 11, verse 15, by Ellen G. White. The night of the first day of the week had worn slowly away. The darkest hour, just before daybreak, had come. Christ was still a prisoner in his narrow tomb. The great stone was in its place. The Roman seal was unbroken. The Roman guards were keeping their watch. And there were unseen watchers. Hosts of evil angels were gathered about the place. Had it been possible, the Prince of Darkness, with his apostate army, would have kept forever sealed in the tomb that held the Son of God. But a heavenly host surrounded the sepulcher. Angels that excelled in strength were guarding the tomb and waiting to welcome the Prince of Life. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, clothed with a panoply of God. This angel left at the heavenly courts. The bright beams of God's glory went before him and illuminated his pathway. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Now, priests and rulers, where is the power of your guard? Brave soldiers that have never been afraid of human power are now as captives taken without sword or spear. The face they look upon is not the face of mortal warrior. It is the face of the mightiest of the Lord's host. This messenger is he who fills the position from which Satan fell. It is he who on the hills of Bethlehem proclaimed Christ's birth. The earth trembles at his approach. The hosts of darkness flee, and as he rolls away the stone, heaven seems to come down to the earth. The soldiers see him removing the stone as he would a pebble, and hear him cry, Son of God, come forth. Thy Father calls thee. They see Jesus come forth from the grave and hear him proclaim over the rent sepulcher, I am the resurrection and the life. As he comes forth in majesty and glory, the angelic host bow low in adoration before the Redeemer and welcome him with songs of praise.
An earthquake marked the hour when Christ laid down his life. And another earthquake witnessed the moment when he took it up in triumph. He who had vanquished death and the grave came forth from the tomb with the tread of a conqueror amid the reeling of the earth, the flashing of lightning, and the roaring of thunder. When he shall come to the earth again, he will shake not the earth only, but also heaven. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage. The heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 26, Isaiah chapter 24 verse 20, and 34 verse 4, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10, and Joel chapter 3 verse 16. At the death of Jesus, the soldiers had beheld the earth wrapped in darkness at midday. But at the resurrection, they saw the brightness of the angels illuminate the night and heard the inhabitants of heaven singing with great joy and triumph. Thou hast vanquished Satan and the powers of darkness. Thou hast swallowed up death in victory. Christ came forth from the tomb glorified, and the Roman guard beheld him. Their eyes were riveted upon the face of him whom they had so recently mocked and derided. In this glorified being they beheld the prisoner whom they had seen in the judgment hall, the one for whom they had plaited a crown of thorns. This was the one who had stood unresisting before Pilate and Herod, his form lacerated by the cruel scourge. This was he who had been nailed to the cross, at whom the priests and rulers, full of self-satisfaction, had wagged their heads, saying, He saved others, Himself he cannot save. Matthew chapter 27, verse 42. This was he who had been laid in Joseph's new tomb. The decree of heaven had loosed the captive. Mountains piled upon mountains over his sepulcher could not have prevented him from coming forth. At the sight of the angels and the glorified Savior, the Roman guard had fainted and become as dead men. When the heavenly train was hidden from their view, they arose to their feet and as quickly as their trembling limbs could carry them, made their way back to the gate of the garden.
Fear not, ye, for we know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Staggering like drunken men, they hurried on to the city, telling those whom they met the wonderful news. They were making their way to Pilate, but their report had been carried to the Jewish authorities, and the chief priests and rulers sent for them to be brought first into their presence. A strange appearance those soldiers presented. Trembling with fear, their faces colorless, they bore testimony to the resurrection of Christ. The soldiers told all, just as they had seen it. They had not had time to think or speak anything but the truth. With painful utterance, they said, it was the Son of God who was crucified. We have heard an angel proclaiming him as the majesty of heaven, the king of glory. The faces of the priest were as those of the dead. Caiaphas tried to speak. His lips moved, but they uttered no sound. The soldiers were about to leave the council room when a voice stayed them. Caiaphas had at last found speech. Wait, wait, he said. Tell no one the things you have seen. A lying report was then given to the soldiers. Say ye, said the priests. His disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. Here the priests overreached themselves. How could the soldiers say that the disciples had stolen the body while they slept? If they were asleep, how could they know? And if the disciples had been proven guilty of stealing Christ's body, would not the priests have been first to condemn them? Or, if the sentinels had slept at the tomb, would not the priests have been foremost in accusing them to Pilate? The soldiers were horrified at the thought of bringing upon themselves the charge of sleeping at their post. This was an offense punishable with death. Should they bear false witness? deceiving the people and placing their own lives in peril? Had they not kept their weary watch with sleepless vigilance? How could they stand the trial, even for the sake of money, if they perjured themselves? In order to silence the testimony they feared, the priests promised to secure the safety of the guard, saying that Pilate would not desire to have such a report circulated any more than they did. The Roman soldiers sold their integrity to the Jews for money. They came in before the priests, burdened with a most startling message of truth. They went out with a burden of money, 
and on their tongues a lying report which had been framed for them by the priests. Meanwhile, the report of Christ's resurrection had been carried to Pilate. Though Pilate was responsible for having given Christ up to die, he had been comparatively unconcerned. While he had condemned the Savior unwillingly, and with a feeling of pity, he had felt no real compunction until now. In terror, he now shut himself within his house, determined to see no one. But the priests made their way into his presence, told the story which they had invented, and urged him to overlook the sentinel's neglect of duty. Before consenting to this, he himself privately questioned the guard. They, fearing for their own safety, dared not conceal anything, and Pilate drew from them an account of all that had taken place. He did not persecute the matter further, but from that time there was no peace for him. When Jesus was laid in the grave, Satan triumphed. He dared to hope that the Savior would not take up his life again. He claimed the Lord's body and set his guard about the tomb, seeking to hold Christ a prisoner. He was bitterly angry when his angels fled at the approach of the heavenly messenger. When he saw Christ come forth in triumph, he knew that his kingdom would have an end and that he must finally die. The priests, in putting Christ to death, had made themselves the tools of Satan. Now they were entirely in his power. They were entangled in a snare from which they saw no escape but in continuing their warfare against Christ. When they heard the report of his resurrection, they feared the wrath of the people. They felt that their own lives were in danger. The only hope for them was to prove Christ an imposter by denying that he had risen. They bribed the soldiers and secured Pilate's silence. They spread their lying reports far and near, but there were witnesses whom they could not silence. Many had heard the soldiers' testimony to Christ's resurrection, and certain of the dead who came forth with Christ appeared to many and declared, that he had risen. Reports were brought to the priests of persons who had seen these risen ones and heard their testimony. The priests and rulers were in continual dread, least in walking the streets or within the privacy of their own homes. They should come face to face with Christ, they felt that there was no safety for them. Bolts and bars were but poor protection against the Son of God. By day and by night, that awful scene in the judgment hall, when they had cried, His blood be on us and on our children, was before them. Matthew 27, 25. Nevermore would the memory of that scene fade from their minds. Nevermore would peaceful sleep come to their pillows. When the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb, saying, Thy father calls thee, 
the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. Now was proved the truth of his words. I lay down my life, that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and rulers. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. John chapter 10 verses 17 and 18, chapter 2 verse 19. Over the rent sepulchre of Joseph, Christ had proclaimed in triumph, I am the resurrection and the life. These words could be spoken only by the deity. All created beings live by the will and power of God. They are dependent recipients of the life of God. From the highest seraph to the humblest animate being, all are replenished from the source of life. Only he who is one with God could say, I have power to lay down my life, and I have power to take it again. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. Christ arose from the dead as the first fruits of those that sleep. He was the antitype of the wave sheaf, and his resurrection took place on the very day when the wave sheaf was to be presented before the Lord. For more than a thousand years, this symbolic ceremony had been performed. From the harvest fields, the first heads of ripened grain were gathered. And when the people went up to Jerusalem to the Passover, the sheaf of first fruits was waved as a thank offering before the Lord. Not until this was presented could the sickle be put to the grain and it be gathered into sheaves. The sheaf dedicated to God represented the harvest. So Christ, the first fruits, represented the great spiritual harvest to be gathered for the kingdom of God. His resurrection is the type and pledge of the resurrection of all the righteous dead. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also would sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14. As Christ arose, he brought forth from the grave a multitude of captives. The earthquake at his death had rent open their graves, and when he arose, they came forth with him. They were those who had been co-laborers with God, and who at the cost of their lives had borne testimony to the truth. Now they were to be witnesses for him who had raised them from the dead. During his ministry, Jesus had raised the dead to life. He had raised the son of the widow of Nain, and the ruler's daughter, and Lazarus. But these were not clothed with immortality. After they were raised, they were still subject to death. But those who came forth from the grave at Christ's resurrection were raised to everlasting life. They ascended with him as trophies of his victory over death and the grave. These, said Christ, are no longer the captives of Satan. I have redeemed them. I have brought them 
from the grave as the first fruits of my power to be with me where I am, never more to see death or experience sorrow. These went into the city and appeared unto many, declaring Christ has risen from the dead, and we be risen with him. Thus was immortalized the sacred truth of the resurrection. The risen saints bore witness to the truth of the words. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Their resurrection was an illustration of the fulfillment of the prophecy. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 19 To the believer, Christ is the resurrection and the life. In our Savior, the life that was lost through sin is restored. For he has life in himself to quicken whom he will. He is invested with the right to give immortality. The life that he laid down in humanity, he takes up again and gives to humanity. I am come, he said, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John chapter 10 verse 10, chapter 4 verse 14, and John chapter 6, 54. To the believer, death is but a small matter. Christ speaks of it as if it were of a little moment. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. He shall never taste of death. To the Christian, death is but a sleep, a moment of silence and darkness. The life is hid with Christ in God, and when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. John chapter 8, verses 51 and 52, and Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. The voice that cried from the cross, It is finished, was heard among the dead. It pierced the walls of sepulchres and summoned the sleepers to arise. Thus will it be when the voice of Christ shall be heard from heaven. That voice will penetrate the graves and unbar the tombs, and the dead in Christ shall arise. At the Savior's resurrection, a few graves were opened, but at his second coming, all the precious dead shall hear his voice and shall come forth to glorious immortal life. The same power that raised Christ from the dead will raise his church and glorify it with him. Above all principalities, above all powers, above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. The end, and God bless you. This video was produced and narrated by Gary L. Studebaker.